Welcome back to another video this is a part 3 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 9. Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 9. Rias is Reaming. Scene Kuo Academy, School Roof. We see two silhouettes embracing one another. It's as if time stood still for that moment. Aside from the sounds of the wind and Issei's occasional whimpering, all was silent. Sona was allowing Issei to release his feelings onto her as she listened closely at his heartbeat while her head lay against his chest. Meanwhile, unknown to the two, Seraphal was floating in the sky, about 30 feet above them, watching the scene play out. Again, she was wearing her magical girl uniform but this time, two black devil wings were exposed from her back. She had a very warm smile as she watched the two hold one another while in their own personal little world. That a girl, my little So-chan. Scene O-R-C. Rias Grimori. So, let me make sure I heard everything correctly. Your best friend, Sona, is allegedly a slut. Issei is an unfaithful pervert. Issei is also accused of sleeping with Seraphal. Issei is also going to be traded from your peerage. Hmm, did I happen to miss anything? Sirzex was absolutely livid as he stood in front of Rias's desk. Rias, who was now sitting back down, had a look of intense panic while at the same time, a look of sheer despair. Deciding to own up to it, Rias grits her teeth and replies to her very angry brother. Onisama, yes, I've said all of those things and I can't even begin to explain as to why I said them. And to make matters even worse, it's actually what I said to Issei, yesterday, when he confessed to me. That was the start of all of this. It's all my fault and I take full responsibility. I don't blame Issei for wanting to run away. I'm a monster, Onisama. Rias then completely breaks down into a crying fit. Akino, even though she is still upset with her, can't help but reach over and hug her sobbing king. Asia and Kaneko both remain silent but feel for their king. Kiba just wants to be out of this room. He would rather be training or doing homework rather than have to suffer this melodrama, in his opinion. Graphia stood next to her husband as she took the time to read everyone in the room. Deciding that coming up with a punishment or two will have to wait, at least until some kind of resolution can be found, especially when it involves Rias's estranged fiancé, the queen maid was attempting to come up with ideas in which to mend the relationship before it became any more volatile. Sirzex was at a loss for words. He wasn't expecting Rias to own up to her mistakes so easily. This was a good sign thought the Mao. However, Rias did use her authority in a cruel way out of sheer spite, even though she was the reason for this entire ordeal from the get-go. This cannot go unchecked or unpunished. But, like his wife, Sirzex was trying to think in constructive ways rather than just petty vengeful justice. Hello everyone, sorry I'm late but I was just making sure that our Red Dragon Emperor was in good hands. Seraphal appeared in the room suddenly via teleportation circle. She had a very happy demeanor toward her body language. Oh, don't worry Sirzex kun Grafia Chan, Ria Tan and all of you, Issei is just fine. Though he was crying for a while, not to mention those four-letter words, Seraphal thought for a moment, trying to mouth the obscenities Issei was using earlier but then got back on track. But yes, Sona is keeping an eye on him. Sirzex and Graphia seem to relax a bit, hearing Seraphal's news. It's the same reaction with the peerage as well. Rias leans back in her chair a bit while not knowing what will happen in the near future. Seraphal then begins to pace the room as she begins to twirl her magical girl scepter in the air. Ria Tan, you, been a naughty little girl. Boo, not very nice, no, not at all. But, it's okay, after all, you are still growing just like Issei. Maybe you two will grow to be closer. Or, maybe, Rias interrupts while tears are jetting from her eyes. You don't understand, Sarah Chan, I didn't mean to, I was just scared. I didn't want him to know, to know about, that, not until graduation at least. So, when he asked to go, steady, I panicked. Seraphal made her way across the desk and then stood directly next to Rias. She then put an arm over Rias's shoulder. This made the Grimori devil cry even harder as she wrapped her arms around Seraphal. The Leviathan Mao then looked over toward Sirzex. Both nodded to one another very seriously. 
Seraphal then pulled back from Rias as she bent down to her eye level. Still smiling, Seraphal spoke very softly. Ria Tan, tomorrow is the start of Golden Week. So, consider it your punishment as I will be taking Issei for the entirety of the holiday. Rias then nodded as she knew she deserved far worse. Seraphal then pats Rias on her head. Rias starts to cry again as she continues to get head pats. Scene, Rooftop. On the far side stone bench, we now see Sona sitting. Issei, on the other hand, was laying on the same bench with his head in Sona's lap. Scene, 10 minutes ago. As the two continued their embrace, Sona proceeded to push her chin upward and look toward Issei's face. Feeling the sensation, Issei then looked down, only to meet Sona's violet stare. Looking very seriously at the broken red dragon emperor, Issei Hiodo, Sona frowns while speaking in a very soft tone. Issei, I know what Rias said to you. But, that's not all. Last night, I spoke with the drake. Issei nods as he continues to stare deeply. Sona then takes a large gulp. Well, you were talking in your sleep. And, well, let's sit down for this, okay. Both teens proceed to sit down together at the far side bench, the same bench they had lunch on together earlier that day. Adjusting her glasses, Sona then clears her throat. I don't want you to think that I was snooping into your personal business, Hiodo, because I really wasn't. Issei nods. It's alright. To be honest with you, I really don't think anyone has really tried, you know, to want to even spend the time to want to know about me, you know, inside and stuff. It's kinda lame when I say it out loud though. Sona shakes her head rapidly, strongly disagreeing with Issei's last statement. No, Issei, that is not, lame, at all. Seeing this sudden reaction from the, Ice Queen, of Kuo Academy, Issei thought to himself again, my first name again, she keeps using it. What the hell is even going on right now? Sona then continues after she catches her breath from her last statement. I know about Rainair, Issei. Issei didn't react like Sona thought he would as he just shrugged his shoulders. Yeah, the bitch is dead, what about it? Sona looked very carefully at Issei's gestures. Sure enough, only the slightest hint of shaking could be seen. Then then continued, I also know what she did to you. More so, how she made you feel. Issei began to tense up. Wah, what are you talking about? Like I said, the bitch is fucking dead. Issei then put a hand over his own mouth, surprised by his own outburst. Sona shakes her head again. Not to you she isn't. She is still alive and well. Right there. Sona now points toward Issei's heart. Issei doesn't move, his facial features don't change. In fact, he doesn't even make a sound. One would assume the teen was just indifferent to everything around him at this point, however his twin rivers of tears proved otherwise. Sona continues as she takes hold of one of Issei's hands. You say that nobody has taken the time to understand you, Hiodo. Well, that, may be true up until now. I think you are much more than you appear to be. I also think that you should have been the one to kill Rainair, not Rias. Issei's eyes widened as he attempted to speak, but alas, he was only able to produce incoherent mumbles mixed along with the sounds of anguish, in a cacophony of chaos. Rain a a a a h h h h g g g m m m. Sona places an index finger on Issei's lips which causes the distraught teen to go silent suddenly. The sea tree heiress is now showing a loving and almost maternal smile. This was something that Issei didn't think was possible. She was so beautiful right now, even in his rage, his sadness, his longing, Sona Sitri was the most beautiful thing in front of him as far as he was concerned. She then very quietly speaks once again. I want you to know something very important. It's something my mother told me when I was young. I don't remember the full poem but it goes a little something like this. The greatest thing, you will ever learn, is to love and be loved, in return. The lines go on, but these are the ones I find great wisdom in. After hearing this, can I ask you a serious question? Issei nods as the tears continue to flow. Using her free hand, Sona takes a handkerchief and starts to wipe at the teen's watery face. Do you think Rias loves you? I mean, I know you love her, it's obvious, I mean, how could you not? She is perfect in every way. So, I suppose what I am trying to say is, do you think someone like her could return your affection in the same and devout way you would offer yours? After that, the two went quiet. 
As they sit together on the bench, Sona, all of the sudden, raises her free arm and places a hand on Issei's head. Lay down, Hyodo, on my lap. Arguing is completely out of the question. Sona had a very serious and demanding tone as Issei felt pressure toward the top of his head as the C3 heiress started to push down. Moving his legs up on the bench, Issei complies with Sona's order without question. Feeling his hair being run through by Sona's fingers, the team couldn't help but enjoy this bit of peace. For now, all was right and it was good. Sona then begins to hum some random tune as the sunset finishes. Again, surprised, Issei found the tone very soothing as his watery eyes began to close. Scene ORC. With that, Rias, you will be responsible for making this school shine like it never has before. Starting tomorrow and throughout the entirety of Golden Week, you will take over as the school's janitor. You will do this without the use of any magic nor will you be allowed the aid of your peerage. Prove yourself and regain your lost honor with this penance. Make me proud, sister. Sirzex was now smiling warmly as he relayed Rius's punishment. Grafia then stepped forward. Sirzex Sama, I will assist Rius Sama with her duties as a taskmaster. Sirzex grins a bit while nodding. Yes, that sounds logical. Rius, who looked very nervous with the news of her punishment, simply nodded while frowning. Very well, Onisama, I will do this. But, well, what about Issei? Seraphal then intervened. Ria Tan, I have a little vacation sort of thing planned out for my Satan and Issei Kun. But don't worry about a thing, as I assure you, they won't be simply sitting around. I have a small mission lined up for my sister's peerage and I want Issei to join them. Grafia tilts her head and responds in all seriousness. If Issei is separated from Rias, what happens if Issei needs a promotion? I don't know the extent of this mission you are sending them on, however, if it involves combat, Issei will be at a disadvantage. Sirzex, along with Rias and the peerage nod in agreement. Seraphal skips over toward Grafia while pulling a piece of jewelry from her magical girl costume pocket. She then presents an average looking gold ring. It has a single and smooth round and red stone in the setting. Seraphal then winks. I got it from Ajuka earlier today. He said that my Satan can use it in case Issei needs a promotion. It's supposed to last for exactly one week. But, boo, Issei has eight pawn pieces, so Ajuka said it might not last as long. But, it's better than nothing, right? Everyone in the room was both fascinated and worried. Then, Rhea stood from her chair. She then looked at Seraphal with a pouting face. Sarah Chan, where are you sending my Issei to? Seraphal smiles and nods. Like I said, it's kind of a vacation, but not really. But to answer your question, I am sending them to Kyoto. Chapter 10, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 10, Cry Little Sister. Scene, Kuo Academy, School Roof. Looking down and at a quiet and still Issei, who was resting quietly on her lap, Sona couldn't help but worry deeply about the teen's reaction to simply hearing the name of his murderer, let alone come to terms with the rest of it all. She needed help and knew that her big sister, as annoying as she can be, would actually take something like Issei's trauma and proceed to treat the situation very seriously. Nodding to herself, Sona was then drawn out of her thoughts when she felt a hand touching behind her shoulder. Turning the angle of her head as to not move her body, which might stir Issei, Sona was not surprised to see the person she was just thinking about. Seraphal had a very calm and collected demeanor, which was unusual considering she was usually quite bubbly and outgoing. Smiling, Sona's sister spoke in a quiet tone while glancing back at Issei. How is he doing, So Chan? Sona still had her frown from earlier as she slowly shook her head from right to left. Then, also quietly, with some emotion behind it, Sona replies. Sarah Oni-chan, it's bad. And I am not talking about Rias either. It's something else. Seeing her sister's watery eyes, the Mao knew something was seriously wrong. Walking in front of both Sona and a sleeping Issei, Seraphal then lowered herself a bit to be at eye level. Sona proceeded to brush Issei's hair with her fingers once again, almost on impulse. Noticing this, Seraphal smiled and looked back up at her sister. So Chan, what's wrong, you can tell me. Seraphal now places a hand on Sona's cheek. Go on, tell your big sis. After a quick breath, 
Sona does the best she can to explain the story of Issei's first death, without completely breaking down as the story was just such a sad one. Slowly, throughout the conversation, we are able to notice Seraphal's smile, as it slowly vanishes the longer Sona speaks. After a bit of time goes by, the younger sister of the sea trees inevitably breaks down once she is finished with her recollection. Hearing what sounds like girls crying, Issei begins to open his eyes only to flinch at where he was laying. Before he was able to move or investigate where the crying was coming from, Issei then felt pressure against the back of his head which pushed his face against and eventually, in between Sona's uniform skirt. As we pan out from the scene, Sona and Seraphal are now hugging each other as they cry together, meanwhile, Issei's head is stuck in between the two devils as his body squirms on the bench. Red alert, red alert, Issei thought. Knowing full well of his dire situation, regardless of how much he was enjoying it, the team knew he'd better find a way out, before the obviously crying president came to her senses and found him down, there. Then an idea came to him. Concentrating deeply, Issei thinks, boost. Instantly Issei feels a rush of power throughout his entire body. Using this opportunity, Issei was able to carefully lift whatever was pushing him into Sona's lap while proceeding to inch his way out from underneath. This plan was working, Issei was almost at the home stretch, that was until he heard a giggle. Issei, oh my, please, warn me next time you grab me there. It was Seraphal's voice, Issei then moved his hands while noticing something warm and rather bouncy and squishy. Then one word came to mind, oh pie. Issei's eyes widened in shock as he looked upward. At this angle, Issei was on his knees as he used the ground to help move his body out from under Sona. At the same time, he was using one of his hands to lift Seraphal off of him as he moved. The problem lies in where Issei had his hand on Seraphal. As Issei was looking up, both girls were looking down. Seraphal had a very happy smile with a small blush. Sona however, had a very confused look which quickly changed into one of anger. Issei, who looked terrified now, attempted to pull back his arm and crawl back, however he was stopped the moment Seraphal put her own hand over Issei's, holding it to her breast. Sona now turned her angry glare toward the Mao as Issei's terrified glance turned into one of now, pure and unadulterated horror. Seraphal then blushes deeply and begins to speak. Sona Tan, I think this is the perfect opportunity to tell you something that's been on my mind, since I came to the human world last night. And since you are also here, Hyodo, the opportunity itself couldn't be more perfect in the manner of timing. Issei and Sona now both tilt their heads questioningly. Seraphal continues at seeing their individual responses. Issei-kun, I think I am in love with you. So-chan, I think I am in love with Issei-kun. Mind sharing, Issei uses what's left of his boost to force his hand from Seraphal as he scoots all the way back from the bench. Sona kept turning her head from Issei to Seraphal while her jaw went completely agape. Seraphal then placed her hands on both of her cheeks while smiling intensely. Where do you think you're going, Issei-kun? As Issei continues to scoot back on his behind, he glances back over toward a livid-looking Sona. Issei then takes a large gulp as he slowly rises from off of the ground. Um, you know what? It's pretty late and all, I really should be getting back home now. So, ah, uh, yeah, I think I'll just. Issei was now inching his way toward the storm door at the rooftop exit. Seraphal lifts an eyebrow and then her smile turns into a grin. Blast. Instantly, the exit leading from the roof way was now covered in a thick sheet of ice. Issei then stopped moving. Seraphal lowered her arm and pointed at the empty spot next to Sona. You aren't going anywhere, Issei-kun. As it stands, you are under my care. Well, mine and my sister's to be precise. Oh, speaking of, Seraphal began to dig around in her uniform pockets while looking for something. While Seraphal frantically searched her pockets while mumbling to herself, Issei made his way reluctantly back to the stone bench. He did this while doing his best to avoid eye contact with a clearly pissed off Sona Citri. Once he sat down, to his surprise, Sona reached for his hand and pulled it toward her side. She then gripped very tightly. Afraid to look directly at the Sona, Issei simply sat still and didn't move. Unknown to Issei, Sona had a blush on her face along with a small smile under that scowl of hers. She then spoke quickly and toward the point. You need to stop running off when you're told to stay put, Hyodo. 
Now look at what I have to do, hold your hand as if you are a baby or something. Sona's blush deepens, it's pathetic, really. Unable to process Sona's words, Issei only had two things going through his mind. Firstly, to his great astonishment, there was a serious possibility that Sona Citri might actually have feelings for him. That in itself seemed nearly unquantifiable. Then there was the fact that Seraphal Leviathan, a Mal of the Underworld, someone who was capable of great destruction and power, had just declared her love to the boy. So maybe all high-class devils weren't the same. There were those who didn't seem to care about status or lineage, was it possible? Was Issei more than just a reincarnated devil to the sea trees? Then Seraphal made a loud and exaggerated yawn as she finally found what she was looking for. So Chan, I got this little thing for you to wear when we go to Kyoto tomorrow. Both Sona and Issei look back at Seraphal with confusion. Sona then replies to her sister hesitantly. Kyoto, what are you talking about now? Seraphal takes hold of Sona's free hand and slips the golden ring on her finger. Seraphal then explains, I want you and Issei, along with your peerage, to come along with me for a week's vacation in Kyoto for Golden Week. Sona looks at the ring while tilting her head. Alright, but why this ring? Issei also takes a look at the piece of jewelry while scratching the back of his head. Seraphal extends her index finger into the air as she explains. This vacation I have planned is also going to involve a mission. Issei will be joining your peerage on this mission. With that ring, Ajuka assured me that you, my sister, would be able to promote Issei as if he was one of your own peerage members. Isn't that cool? Sona looks confused as does Issei. Sona then replies, what about Rias? Issei then frowns while now turning his gaze toward the ground. Sona notices this but gets distracted by Seraphal's answer. Rias, for all intents and purposes, is grounded for the remainder of Golden Week. There is more but I am not at liberty to discuss anything more at this time. So, how about we get you two back home, after all, the train leaves at 7 am sharp tomorrow morning, you both will need your rest. Raising his head and looking back at Seraphal, Issei spoke up. So, once I'm packed up, do you want me to meet you guys at the train station then? Seraphal grins, oh, you won't be going back to, that, home. I meant my Satan's little abode, you know, your other home, Issei. Issei was about to speak up, that was until Sona tightened her grip on his hand. Deciding to simply give in, Issei chose to nod and keep quiet for now. Nodding her head, Seraphal then began to twirl her magical girl scepter while a large and sky blue teleportation circle manifested below the three devils. Blue flash, scene, underworld, Grimori mansion. Don't you think this may be going a bit overboard, Graphia? Sirzex looked to have a few sweat drops dripping from his forehead as he was clearly nervous. Graphia, who was sitting on one of the large and crimson sofas, now crosses her legs as she gives her husband a stern look. You dote on your sister far too much sometimes. You really don't take the extent of what she has done that seriously, do you? Sirzex nods overly enthusiastically while trying to turn his nervous smile into a serious frown. Of course I am taking all of this extremely seriously. But I also know that Rias is still a child and she is still learning the ropes of being a high-class devil. She's 17 years old, Graphia. Graphia now crosses her other leg while closing her eyes frustratingly. Sirzex, your sister asked that we arrange a marriage between her and Hyodo. She then proceeds to alienate the boy. Then, when he ends up finding solitude within the Citri clan, Rias jumps the gun. She assumes the worst and punishes the already confused kid. She threatened to remove him from her life, someone she allegedly loves, as if he was a disposable. Camera, I don't care if she didn't mean any of it, regardless, it was a nasty thing she did. I call that blatant manipulation toward the highest degree. Unacceptable behavior. If she were my sister, why I'd spank each and every ounce of that spoiled rotten behavior right out of her. Sirzex relents and sits down next to Graphia while trying not to laugh at her ridiculous sounding statement. Placing an arm around her, he then nods slowly in agreement. Maybe you're right, I suppose I have been too easy on her. Sirzex then looks over in the corner and cringes. But, you really want to use, that, surely there are others that could do the job. I hear that one has quite the reputation. Graphia lays back and into her husband while grinning. Reaching for her husband's face, 
Graphia was about to kiss the worried and smiling Mao, but spoke quietly before doing so. Don't you worry about a single thing, darling. As far as Rias is concerned, this was all my idea. So, relax, you. Dot R. Dot off. Dot the, hook. Kisu. Chapter 11. Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 11. Sit down, let's talk. Scene, Kyoto Residence. So Rias has to stay at the Orc for the entirety of Golden Week. Asia, who was sitting on Issei's large bed, looked very depressed as she asked her question. Akino then nods with a sad frown. It's part of her punishment along with cleaning the entire campus. As sad as it is, Rias had it coming. The rest of the peerage nod in agreement. Oddly, Kiba was also present while he sat in a computer chair next to Issei's desk. He then looks at each girl in the room and shakes his head. Closing his eyes, the knight speaks up in a soft and direct tone. As Akino-san says, President Rias needs to learn her lesson. But, doesn't that suggest that we should be learning our own lessons in all of this? Maybe we should have backed up Hyodo, when it mattered. Personally, I've never seen him act the way he did in front of President Rias. Also, there is a good possibility that Issei has lost his faith in us as his friends. Kaneko, who is sitting next to Asia on the bed, rolls her eyes. If Hyodo Baka had any common sense, he would have come to us, rather than run to the sea trees like a little bitch. Kaneko then folds her arms as she closes her frustrated eyes. Akino, who is now standing feet from a sitting Kaneko, proceeds to glare down at the little white-haired devil. You're not helping the situation, so kindly keep your Sunere comments to yourself. Kaneko opens her eyes in a surprised and flustered fashion as her cheeks puff out. She then spots a very angry Akino, not two feet from her. Deciding that a retaliative remark might get her in a bit of pain, Kaneko then closes her eyes again. Sorry, Akino, I didn't mean it, I'm just frustrated ASL all hell. Akino nods and sits down next to Asia and Kaneko. Thinking for a moment, the queen of the peerage comes up with a solid plan in her opinion. Well, we do know one thing. Issei is more than likely staying at the place he stayed last night. I happen to know where Sona Citri lives as I have gone there numerous times with Rias in the past. How about the four of us go pay Issei a visit? After all, we probably won't see him again until next week. That's a long time to let thoughts fester. So, what do you all say? Want to go for an evening stroll? Instantly, each member of the peerage started to grow a smile of their own though Kaneko's was hardly noticeable. Scene, Sona's dorm. Blue flash as the summoning circle disappears, Seraphal, Sona and Issei are left standing. Seeing this, Tsubaki, who was in the kitchen nook while in the process of making something that smelled amazing began to set up a serving tray for four individuals. She paid no mind to the sudden teleportation, rather she seemed very used to such things. As Seraphal skipped over toward Tsubaki, she proceeded to bend over a bit and smell what was being prepared. Oh, Tsubaki-chan, you are so thoughtful. I am very hungry and you look to have prepared a very large portion. Did you know I would be staying for dinner? Tsubaki, without a word, simply nodded while maintaining her stoic features. Seraphal picked up on something about her sister's queen while staring deeply into her lowered eyes, behind those glasses of hers. Then the Mao of the underworld began to smirk a bit. Placing one of her hands on Tsubaki's shoulder, Seraphal then moved her lips close to Tsubaki's ear. Pissed, I bet you just can't wait until Issei tries your cooking, am I right? Tsubaki pulls away from Seraphal as she blushes heavily. This makes the Mao begin to giggle. Thought so. Meanwhile, Sona and Issei made their way into the dining area and sat down at the table, both watching the strange scene between Seraphal and Tsubaki. As everyone is gathered around the table and eating their dinner, the only person to continue to make conversation was Seraphal, to Sona's great annoyance. She would continue to ask Issei questions about Milky Chan and her adventures. Then, to Sona's further annoyance Issei would react to Seraphal's stories as if he was the greatest fan of hers to ever exist. But then Sona looked deeply into Issei's warm eyes, his smile, his mannerisms, he was happy. He wasn't crying, he wasn't looking as if he wanted to end it all, no, right now, he looked to be at peace. Sona chose to not be annoyed, for Issei's sake. 
As a small smile started to creep its way along the Citri heiress's face, Seraphal stood from the small table as she began to stretch. Well then, I suppose I should be off. After all, I do have some responsibilities to take care of before our trip tomorrow morning. Oh, that's right, Subaki, can you please contact Saji and see if he has extra clothes for our Issei? Issei then stood from his position which surprised Sona. Sounding a bit emasculated, Issei spoke up with a slight grumpiness to his speech. Milky, I don't need you guys to go this far out of your way, just for me. I am perfectly capable of collecting my own clothes, from my own bedroom, regardless of Rias or anyone else. Issei then folded his arms together while nodding to himself. Seraphal, Sona and Subaki said nothing at first, that was until Seraphal proceeded to use her magical scepter on Issei's head. B-O-N-K, hey, that hurt, what the hell, Issei was now rubbing the top of his head with both hands. Seraphal then places her arms against her waist while tapping her foot against the floor. Along with a victorious smirk, the Mao then speaks in a very no-nonsense tone, similar to her younger sisters. Do as I tell you, Issei-kun. Otherwise I may do something that you may not find very pleasant. Then Seraphal's smirk turns into her usual warm and bubbly smile. So, be a good boyfriend Kun and do what Milky Chan says, okay. This makes Sona and Subaki both raise eyebrows as both of Issei's eyes widen at the statement. Then, before another word could be uttered, Seraphal simply winks as she vanishes in a circle of blue energy. Sona, Subaki and Issei just stare at where Seraphal used to be, all with looks of quiet shock. Then everyone jumps as the apartment notification intercom goes off. Hello, President Citri, are you there? Issei thought the voice sounded familiar though it was garbled by a bit of static. Sona and Subaki now had looks of worry as they glanced at each other. Then Sona looked from Subaki and toward the door to the bathroom. Nodding now back toward Sona, as she understood her king's silent orders, Subaki proceeds to get up from her position while then reaching and placing both of her hands, firmly, on both of Issei's shoulders. As Issei found himself quite literally being dragged toward the bathroom, the teen was about to protest, that was until Subaki slammed the door shut. Take a bath, Hyodo, I will have clothes prepared for you once you're finished. Issei now stood in the bathroom while staring at the closed door with a slight tilt to his head. What is up with their obsession with me taking baths? Did I not wear deodorant today or something? Then, to Issei's further surprise, music started to be blasted from the other room. Aside from the music being loud, it was also techno and not just that, Issei could recognize the song. What does the fox say? Back in the living area, after Sona turned up her stereo, she then walked to the intercom next to the entrance door of her apartment. Akino, what can I do for you this evening all of a sudden? After a few minutes go by, Tsubaki opens the front door as Akino, Kaneko, Asia and Kiba walk in as they all remove their shoes at the entrance. As they were looking around the small apartment, maybe to see Issei, however they had their attention drawn toward Sona as she clears her throat. She was sitting on the loveseat while adjusting her glasses. Then, as if on cue, Akino sat down on a small toga mat as the other three joined her. Tsubaki remained standing with her arms folded. After another moment of awkward silence, Sona then pointed toward Akino with her usual stoic tendencies. Why are you here, Peerage of Grimori? Sona sounded colder than usual as she looked very cross. Akino attempted a friendly smile while replying. We are worried about Issei. He has gone through a lot with the president and we just wanted to support him. We're his friends after all. The other Peerage members, aside from Kaneko, all nod. Sona then scowls as she has a look of sheer disgust plastered to her curling lips. PFF, friends are you? Really, you are his, friends. Please then, enlighten me, tell me one personal thing about your friend that only he and you would know about. The peerage members look at each other with puzzled looks. Nobody was able to reply to Sona's question. This made the Citri heiress even more enraged. Right, that's what I thought. You aren't here for Hyodo. You are simply Rias's cronies, following her orders like the, friends, you are. Coming here just to, I don't know, talk him back into coming home with you. Was that what Rias told you for to do? Akino stood up while pointing accusingly at Sona. Insultingly, the Thunder Queen spoke. How dare you, 
Issei is indeed our friend and a part of the Grimori family. Who do you think you are? As Akino had the backing of the rest of the peerages all of them nodded angrily, Kaneko included this time, Sona proceeded to smirk angrily. Who am I? You ask. I am Issei's real friend. I am his friend not because he is some flashy weapon, not because he can be useful to me, not because he is the Red Dragon Emperor of Domination, not for any of those reasons. Asia then squeaks. That's not true, not true. I care very much for Issei. He tried to save my life and I will never forget that. Sona nods while not changing her demeanor. Yes, you like him because he did something for you. But let me ask all of you one simple and I mean, very simple, question. Do you have any idea of what post-traumatic stress disorder can do to the human psyche if left unchecked? Then, Akino, Asia, Kaneko and Kiba all nod seriously, as all of them have their own demons. Akino then shrugs her shoulders. We aren't stupid, Citri, get to your damned point already. Adjusting her glasses once again, Sona looks toward Tsubaki who nods back to her. Looking back at Rias's peerage, the Citri heiress releases a deep breath of air. Rainair. What do you know about Rainair? Asia starts to shudder a bit which gains the attention of Akino, Kaneko and Kiba. She then stands up and nods her head. Yes, I know about Rainair. We had a run-in as the evil angel wanted my sacred gear. She killed me to get it. I was also told that she killed Issei too. Sona nods while softening her gaze toward the little devil nun. I am sorry to have brought up this bad memory. You have my sympathy, Asia Argento. Asia nods while sitting back down. Akino then places an arm over the startled nun's shoulder while offering her a reassuring smile. This makes Asia return a soft smile of her own. Sona then continues on. Dedrag told me in some detail, about what Rainer actually did to Issei. It wasn't just the fact that she killed him. That was only a small part of the real problem. Akino tilts her head while lifting an eyebrow. The Red Dragon Emperor spoke to you. Well, then, what did he say, pre tell? Sona takes another deep breath. Rainair played and toyed with Hyodo. Even when she needlessly killed him in that slow and gruesome manner, she continued to mock and berate him. Peerage of Grimori, Issei was in love with Rainair. Now, consider the following if you will. Knowing how Issei's mind works and considering his recent past, Rias all of the sudden shows and scoops him up and brings him into the world of devils. Shortly after, she sends him mixed signals and even relies on him to end her arranged marriage with Riser Phoenix. Naturally, someone is loving. Dot Erm Daft, yeah, Daft is Issei Erm Hyodo, well, someone like him would think that Rias might actually return his affection. But we all know how that ended up, right? Akino, Asia, Kiba and even Kaneko look to be very distraught regarding Sona's proclamation. Tsubaki, still standing near the door, nods to herself while showing a frown of her own. Sona then takes off her glasses and begins to rub her tired eyes. Scene 10 minute ago, Sona's bathroom. Laying back into the modest bathtub, Issei had a cold wash rag laying on his forehead. He could still hear the loud and blaring techno music and couldn't help but wonder what was going on with Sona and Tsubaki. His thoughts were interrupted as the high-pitched sounds of a magical barrier seemed to resonate throughout the entirety of the small bathroom. Issei-kun, sorry I took so long, mal business you see. Now, don't tell me that you've already washed your back. It was Seraphal again. This time, the devil looked to be wearing a grey Ku girl's gym bathing suit. Issei purposely sank deeper into the bathtub as both of his hands quickly covered his crotch area. Chapter 12. Sona's Chance. A high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 12. Milky Cookies. Scene, Sona's bathroom. Issei was now sitting on a small wooden stool as he had a towel over his midsection. Meanwhile, Seraphal was on her knees with sponge in hand, wiping at Issei's back, very softly. The teen looked incredibly embarrassed as his face had a large tint of red, plastered near his nose and cheeks. Seraphal on the other hand, looked to be having the time of her life. She had a bright, infectious and warm smile along with her usual bubbly demeanor. Aside from the loud music coming from the other room, all was silent. All of the sudden, Seraphal proceeded to move into Issei's back with her chest as she reached her lips near Issei's ear. Panicking at the sudden sensation of Milky Chan's breasts, pressed up against his back, 
the teen couldn't help but tense up. Then, instantly, Issei felt his ear, being nibbled on. Pulling back his head and turning it slightly so that he could have at least one eye on Seraphal's face, Issei's worried frown turned into a slightly perverted yet still, nervous smile. Opening his mouth so as not to choke on his words, Issei spoke as clearly as he could, despite his overwhelming urges, which tied along with some strange feeling of regret and distrust. Can I ask you a question, without sounding ungrateful? I mean, you guys have done nothing but help me and I really can't even begin to tell you how much I appreciate you and Sona for all of it, but, well, I. Seraphal then wraps both of her arms around Issei as she rests her head on his shoulder. You want to know why, don't you? Issei, I know that deep down, you don't trust me or my sister. Issei tenses up at both Seraphal's actions and now her words. Noticing this, the Mao tightens her grip just a bit while she continues what she wants to convey. I don't blame you for thinking that, not at all. I can only imagine how your poor little heart must have shattered when that terrible evening happened for you. I know, it's all right. And, now, with the current situation, I can't blame you for not trusting anyone who has to do with high-class devil society. Completely overtaken, Issei felt as though Seraphal, even though she wasn't looking in his eyes at the moment, was somehow able to read his thoughts. It was either that, or Seraphal was much wiser than she appears to be. Wait, how old was Seraphal anyway? Issei thought that would have to be a question for much, much later. Seraphal lightly kisses Issei's shoulder once before continuing her talking. I am not like those guys, as I am sure you are beginning to learn. Also, my sister's views are similar. So, no, there isn't anything that we want from you. Well, that may not be entirely true. Seraphal goes in for another kiss toward Issei's neck this time. Issei, trying to think clearly, replies to Seraphal after a large and dry gulp. Okay, wait, then why? If you two don't want the Red Dragon Emperor, like, I don't know, on your side or something, then, I just don't get it. I'm just a stupid kid, if it weren't for Dedrag, I'd be nothing. Hell, even when, Ray, RRR, that bitch, asked me out, I knew, really deep down, I knew, Milky, that there was something up. It was too good to be true, but, being too stupid pervert I am, well, I just walked into that one like a complete simp. Issei was now looking straight ahead toward the cream-colored bathroom wall. He was slowly shaking his head as his eyes began to close. Seraphal, now lifted her head and proceeded with a confused tilt. You really think that way about yourself? Issei, you are a baka. Seen, Sona's living room. So, as it stands, the way I look at it, if you four really want to make amends and reinforce your ties with Hyodo, I won't stand in your way. Sona then looks toward each member while nodding. However, you are going to leave him in my care for Golden Week. I don't know if you were told but. Akino interrupts. Yes, we know about Issei working alongside your peerage. That's why we came in the first place, to see him before you leave for Kyoto. Sona nods as she adjusts her sloping glasses. I see. Well, unfortunately, it's quite late as we will be leaving rather early in the morning. Therefore, after Issei is finished in the bathroom, we will be retiring for the night as sleep is a priority. Then, all of the peerage shout in unison. Issei is here. Sona gains a tick mark however she nods again. As I said, it doesn't matter. Issei, Erm, Hyodo, will be going to sleep the moment his bath is finished. Akino then raises an eyebrow. You sound like his mother, President Citri. This gets the rest of the peerage into a suspicious state as they look at Sona with questioning looks. Blushing suddenly, Sona shakes her head rapidly. No, that is certainly not the case. As student council president, not to mention, as the king of my peerage, it is my duty to make sure everyone gets a good night's sleep without interruption. Akino picks up on the blush that Sona is producing as she begins to smirk. All right, all right, fair enough. Okay, Kiba, Asia, Kaneko, we'll come back next week. President Sona, Please be gentle with our precious Kuai, era era. As the peerage make their way out, Sona's blush continues to intensify to ungodly proportions. Tsubaki then shuts the door behind the four while folding her arms again. She then looked over toward Sona. Adjusting her own glasses this time, Tsubaki commented. Well, that could have gone a lot worse. President, are you alright? 
You seem very, red. Seen, Sona's bathroom. Isei kun, I'm finished with your back, now, get back into the tub. Seraphal had a grumpy disposition all of the sudden. Picking up on her unusual tone which suggested her request was more of an order, the teen simply stood with his towel and did what he was told. Once he got back into the water, he was further surprised to know that Seraphal was now getting into the bathtub as well, although she still looked rather angry. Once she got in, she pulled the teen into a forceful sitting, spoon position in which the Mao was the big spoon. As her back was laying against the end of the small bathtub, she had the back of the flustered teen's head, laying on her chest. Issei didn't move a muscle as he was in such shock that even something as simple as a perverted nosebleed, all seemed impossible at the moment. Seraphal then took a very large breath and held it for a moment before releasing it. Issei could feel the Mao's chest rising and falling. Now feeling her arms around him and tightening the kid had no idea what he was in for. Seraphal then spoke up again, this time in a softer tone. I think my sister may be correct about you. You are indeed a big fat baka head. But, I think it's a trait that makes you very cute. Seraphal's smile returns. You asked, why you? Well, I will tell you, Issei Hyodo. For me, it started back at the school, when you gave me that tour I asked for. Issei, I've been around for a very, very long time and in all of that, not once have I been treated in the same manner as you've treated me. Issei tilts his head while relaxing his body all of the sudden. How do other people treat you, Milky? Seraphal's smile looks a bit sadder now. I am Seraphal Leviathan. My name alone strikes fear into the hearts of many who live within the underworld. I've done things, in my past, things that have made me rather infamous. So, whenever I would get approached by possible suitors, they all wanted what I could give them, rather than wanting me for me. Issei, you treat me like a woman. Even knowing who and what I am, all you see is your idol, Milky. You don't see the monster I really am. Issei flips around in the bathtub suddenly, which splashes water everywhere. To Seraphal's surprise, Issei was now looking down at her with a great intensity of sparking within his eyes. He had both of his arms, one on each side of Seraphal's head, as he kept himself pushed up and over the super devil. Looking angry now, Issei replies back to Seraphal. You are not a monster. Seraphal's deep and blue eyes were now gathering tears. Issei took a deep breath of his own and then continued. You are Seraphal Leviathan. You are a woman, a very beautiful one at that mind you. You are also Milky Chan from, Milky Spiral. I don't care if you could destroy this entire planet ten times over, that doesn't change the fact that you are a person, not a fucking object. Issei's anger now turns into rage as his gaze moves from Seraphal to now another end of the bathroom wall. I know what it's like, to feel. Like nothing more than some weapon, just to be used. Though, to be honest, I didn't know what it felt like until yesterday. So, you must have it so much harder than I do. But still, it's complete bullshit, right? We are just people for fuck's sake. Issei got interrupted as his mouth was currently being invaded by the tongue of Seraphal. Scene, Sona's living room. I'm fine, Tsubaki, don't worry about it. Sona now crosses her legs while tugging at her uniform blazer in and out as if she was trying to cool herself down. Tsubaki nods and closes her eyes. Very well. Also, President, might I remind you about Hyodo, he is still in the bathroom. Looking toward the bathroom door, Sona's vanishing blush begins to return. He has been in there for a curiously long amount of time, hasn't he? Tsubaki nods while making her way toward the bathroom door, she then lightly knocks. Hyodo, did you drown in there or something? Some of the rest of us would like to use the restroom if you don't mind. Not hearing a response, Tsubaki then points at the door while looking toward Sona. Seeing this, Sona yells loudly from her position. Hyodo, are you asleep again? Still not hearing a response, Sona stands up while she marches toward the bathroom as her look implies suspicion. I am opening the door, you'd better be decent. Sona then turns the door handle. As it opens, Sona is greeted by the large blue and translucent magic of a protection barrier. Then, through the blue barrier, Sona saw something that caused her body to release ungodly amounts of adrenaline. Issei was on top of her sister, in the bathtub as the two were, as the two were. No, 
Sona began to pound on the barrier with both of her fists and she began to scream in a fit of pure anger. Stop kissing my sister Yubaka. Stop kissing my boyfriend, Seraphal. Instantly, both Seraphal and Issei separated from their kiss, only to see Sona, pounding insanely against a magical barrier. Both Issei and Seraphal now had similar looks. The looks implied that they've been caught with their hands in the proverbial cookie jar. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.